I'm thankful for the choir because each week they spend time on Thursdays rehearsing and then coming in early on Sundays, ensuring that they're ready to help lead us in worship. And next Sunday is their last Sunday before summer choir starts. So choir, thank you for what you do week in and week out. Uh, You also are teachers. You're also teachers through song, so we're deeply thankful for that. Uh, In your bulletin is your take-home work, and this week we're going to study what the Holy Spirit is in our scriptures. And so if this is something that's been curious of how's this Trinitarian God work, Father, Son, Spirit, uh, this is the week that you're going to dive deeply into the Spirit's language. And today is Pentecost. It is the 1,982nd birthday of the church. How cool is that? (laughs) 1,982 years ago, today, was a day unlike any other, as the Spirit came and infused a community of 120 believers, and lifted them and let them speak in a language that everyone else around the community could understand. And that day, after Peter preached quite a sermon, 3,000 people joined that movement that we now are a part of all these years later. 1,982 years. I thought about trying to get enough birthday candles for a cake, but I don't think there's enough on the island to do that, or enough air in our lungs to blow out all those candles. But uh, historically, we've always celebrated this day by wearing the color red, as that's the color of the Spirit. And so we invite you to wear red today, and I have a robe on, but I always wear my lucky red pants. (laughs) So you can't really see them, but like the bottom quarter of it... uh, But today is a day that I get to wear these pair of pants, and when else do you get to wear red pants? And people not look at you kind of funny. Well, you probably do, but that's okay. It's Pentecost. Uh, Today, I hope that we can summarize these last seven weeks of talking about virtues, and what does it mean for us to taste a little bit of heaven on earth? And today we turn to a book in our scriptures, the book of Amos, a prophet that most people have never heard of, let alone read. Uh, But my hope is that it's not as gloomy as it sounds if you listen carefully to what the prophet is saying. So would you pray with me as we jump in to this sermon time together? O Spirit of God, fall afresh on us. In the same way that you filled that first gathering of people to birth your church, would you fill us with that same spirit that we may be filled with hope and anticipation, with power and with grace. And so in these moments, would you help us to taste a little bit of heaven as we explore this last virtue, the virtue of justice. For the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever visited the desert? The desert is an interesting place because of the barrenness of it. That what we're so used to of living in the tropics of beauty and green and plants and flowers, you go to the desert and it's stark and it seems lifeless. In fact, the desert is this place that we often see the mirage of what's ahead of us that's not really there. And in the desert, if you've ever traversed the desert, you realize that it doesn't take long to be sapped of your energy and strength because the desert is this dry place. Now, many of you have, may not have been to an actual desert, but my assumption is all of us have been to the desert that we experience in the spiritual life. In fact, throughout church history, one thing that's been true from every generation is that we all are invited to go into the desert for a season of time. The desert in the spiritual life is this place where we feel dry, barren, feeling that God is somewhere way off and that, that we're just sapped of all spiritual energy. Is the desert a place that you and I want to live in? No. But it's necessary for us to grow in our faith. Because in the desert, we learn some valuable lessons. The three lessons that pop into my head about exploring and living in the place of deserts is one, 
We go into the desert pondering. Pondering. God, where are you? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Where are you calling me to go? The desert is this place of longing where we enter in with this pondering question that, that guides us in this journey. But while we're in the desert, as we live there, we realize that the desert is actually a place of preparation. Preparation. The desert is this place that we go to prepare for something else that's going to come. Interesting that Israel spends 40 years where? In the desert, preparing to be God's people in the promised land. Jesus, at the very start of his ministry, after the Spirit of God comes upon him, he doesn't go and start teaching people. Instead, he sent where? To the desert for 40 days. The desert is this place of enrichment, of preparation, of getting ready for what's getting ready to happen. And it's a place in which we give up trying to control everything and finally standing and saying, God, have your way with me. And third, we leave the desert with perseverance. We leave it with perseverance because we realize that we can survive anything and that we have a new arsenal of tools around us, most often God's Spirit. You see, the desert isn't a place that we ever want to dwell, but it's the necessary place that we all must visit as we continue to grow deeper in our faith. Today, I'm reminded of these early apostles and disciples, 120 of them, that are gathered in this room in Jerusalem, and this belief that on this Jewish holiday, Pentecost, they're celebrating with their fellow Jews. Remember, they're not Christians at this point. There was no such thing. They've gone through the horror of Good Friday, the hope of Resurrection Sunday, and then Jesus appears and lives with them for a period of time and then ascends into the heavens. And here they are waiting in a desert. What now? What are we to do with ourselves? Our scriptures are almost mute on what they do in this season of waiting. But it's a season of preparing. And isn't it amazing that on this Pentecost day, the Spirit of God descends upon them and they begin to speak the languages of all the different dialects of the community so that everyone could understand the story of God in their native tongue. In fact, that moment, the church grows exponentially. And the movement that we call now Christian begins. My hope is that today we can understand and dive into a deeper question that we all must, must wrestle with. And the question is this. What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the church universal? And what is the purpose of Central Union Church? What I found is that question leads to a lot of other questions. And it's a journey. And understanding the heart of why the Spirit birthed the church in the first place. But to oversimplify it, what I would say to you is that what is the purpose of the church? <clears throat> it's to be a transformed people willing to transform the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. To be a transformed people willing to transform the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are invited into this new economy of grace, which God's ways are the normative ways, and the ways of our world disappear. That in this place, you and I are invited in this sanctuary to be encountered by God and leave from this place different than we walked in, to go transform the world wherever we end up. But the challenge for us isn't that different from the time of Amos. You see, what ended up happening was the people of God, they had lost the sight of why they existed in the first place. And so Amos comes on the scene, one of the most despised of all the prophets, because of the message that he has, it's like hellfire and brimstone. Do you know what that phrase means? Not good. And he comes in preaching and saying to the religious people, you miss the point altogether. The church, the people of God, are about the ways of God, not about doing things right or knowing the right things to say or doing the right sacrifices at the right moment. 
It is about embodying God around us. And so all these festivals that you do, good for you. You miss the point. I despise them. The sacrifices that you give them, I hate them. Now, I don't know about you in my house with my kids, if they use the word hate, woo, there's a reckoning coming. That's a bad word in our house. We don't use the word hate. But what does our scriptures say? I hate what you are becoming. You've missed the point of who we have been called to be together. I sometimes wonder if Amos' message needs to be heard in today's world again. It's not about knowing the right things to say or coming to church every week because that's what good people do. It's not even about me, this church thing. It's about us and God. And I'm invited to give up my normative ways of being right and self-justified in order to follow a different way that leads me to give up myself and to take on the Spirit's way in me. And truth be told, it's a hard journey. It leads you to deserts in which you have to go and wrestle, but at the exit of the desert time, you leave a different person free in a way you never dreamed possible. But Amos' time, there was a group of people called the Israelites that were struggling with what it meant to be God's people. Do we do all these things right, but we ignore the very essence of what our call is? And our call is to be a blessing not to each other, although that's a part of it. Our call is to be a blessing to all nations. And we are people that are called to care for the widows, and to care for the orphans, and to care for the poor by leaving enough grain on the edges of our fields so that the poor can come and eat their fill. We're called to welcome the stranger, the foreigner, and welcome them as a part of our family. We're called to be a people that seek justice. And not my justice, God's justice. Justice is a big word, and it's a powerful word. But in our Christian tradition, in the 1,982 years, this word justice has taken on two different forms that are quite contrary to each other. On the one hand is a justice that's often taught and preached that's about retribution, about getting even, about an eye for an eye kind of justice. You punch me, I punch you kind of justice. And this justice is portrayed that that's who God is, that God is mad at each and every one of you because of who you are and God needs retribution for your sinfulness. And so that line of thinking looks at the sacrificial system and lines of God's retribution. And we paint this picture of God, our Father in the heavens, who is the angry, angry, angry old man that has a list of naughty and nice. And then Jesus has to come to appease the wrath of God, the anger, the justice of God. Well, I'm not one that believes that's what our scripture normative story of justice is. Instead, I think there's another image of justice in our scriptures that's over here that's often quiet and overshadowed in our culture today for sure. And this is an image of justice that is marked by restoration. Restoration. The goal of this justice is to bring wholeness into communities and relationships. The goal of God with us is to restore us. Not to judge us, but to restore us into wholeness with God and with each other and with ourselves. And so this image of justice is most notably seen in the, the last 10 years of what's happened in a country far away from here called Rwanda. Do you remember the 90s, the Rwandan genocide that happened? In which one tribal group ended up going and trying to kill out the other tribal group. And as the world was appalled at this action, Suddenly it stopped. But what happened in the normative experience of tribal groups is that the other tribe gets power, and guess what they do? They have a retribution of justice 
aka they go now and do the same thing that happened to them by killing and maiming and injuring people. But Rwanda figured out that this cycle would never stop unless if they had a new image of justice. And that image of justice is restoration. And so a few years ago, a story was put out about stories of restoration in Rwanda. And it, perhaps the most meaningful story was of a woman, an elderly woman, whose husband and all of her sons were killed as they, this tribal group came in and, and destroyed their whole entire village, burned everything to the ground, killed everyone that they could find. She survived. And she had this great hatred for this other people among them. And as they got out of jail and as they came back into the community, while they were in jail, they learned about restorative justice. And one young guy came to meet with her and said, I am one who burned your house. I killed your sons. And I seek your forgiveness. What can I do to make this whole? She looked at him and said, I have forgiven you already. But since you burned my house down, I have had nowhere to live. That day he left and got all of his buddies that destroyed this village. And they came back and built her a home. But it didn't stop there. He said to her, you are now my mother, and I will care for you as long as you live. There's this amazing picture of he and her, and he's quite tall, and she's quite short with his arm around her. And you can see that she's quite uncomfortable still with him. But they're seeking restoration. Does she have the right for retribution? Well, so that's certainly the way of our world, isn't it? An eye for an eye. But Jesus says to us, I, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, if someone slaps you on the, the one cheek, turn and let him slap you on the other one also. You see, our goal as Christians is to bring restoration, justice to our world. And not to continue the cycles of violence and pain and retaliation. Back to Amos. Amos is saying to the people of God, you all have missed the point. You care more about yourselves and doing it right rather than being the people of God that go out and live it. In fact, Amos's name is quite interesting. It literally means a li to lift a burden. To lift a burden. When we seek justice, what we are seeking is to lift the burdens of others. To allow them the space to find freedom and hope and love. And to spread that in their families and into the world around them. The problem is, is that's not the way of our world, is it? You see, if jails worked, we wouldn't have to build more of them, would we? Instead, what we know in America is that we are continuing to build bigger and bigger jails. And that people are sentenced for however many years and they go into jail and they're supposed to come out somehow different and what we know is they don't come out any different. And there's no restoration of bringing wholeness back to the brokenness that they created. And until that happens, we're going to all always live in brokenness. How do you live justly? How do you bring restoration to the world around you? How do you be God's people that care for the widow, the orphans, the poor, the stranger, the enemy, the family member? How do we live this together? Well, first we have to ponder. You and I need to spend some time pondering, what is the purpose of this whole thing? Why do we gather as Central Union Church? If we're going to be a people that are God's people for this day and age, what does it mean that we all get to do together? Next Sunday, May 31st, at 10 o'clock, right after this worship service, 
is what I believe is going to be one of those days that defines the rest of our life together at Central Union. We have our annual meeting, and what I've been told is that our annual meetings average about 125 people. 125 people in a church that claims 1,311 members. We're not just voting on who's coming on council. We're going to release the vision that we believe God has for us as a community of faith. We're going to gather to talk about what's happened in the past and celebrate the good things and get ready for next year because we're on the move. The Spirit of God is at work and is working through you all in order for us to be a vibrant church in today's day and age that impacts and transforms lives. And so next Sunday at 10.15-ish, you're going to hear once again the mission statement that council has worked tirelessly on. And here it is. We engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. We engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. It's what we're going to use to point us in a direction. To say, how do we use our resources in this church? Does it work through this filter? Does it engage people? Does it embrace people? And does it help us to embody Christ to the world around us? If it doesn't, we shouldn't be doing it. That we as a community need to gather and fill this place with our membership because we believe the Spirit isn't done with this yet, but is doing something new and fresh and using people like you to do it. I have this belief that every single thing that we need right now is already here. You. This church has run a deficit budget for far too many years. We have more than enough money to run this church. The problem is, is it's in your pockets and it's not coming out fast enough. I believe that we don't need to go hire droves of staff members to do the ministry of this church because we have you, the priesthood of all believers, right here living and dwelling among us. I believe that everything that we're becoming is already in place now. What we want to see is us as a congregation rise up together and say we're in this together and we're going to fight the good fight and we're going to go out and transform lives because we believe that God isn't done and this story makes a difference. That you are loved beyond measure and nothing can separate you from God's love and that we're called to go and do justice in our world. And so next Sunday, I have an expectation that none of you are going to leave your pew after service. And if you do, we have a cattle prodder out by the door. Just kidding, we aren't going to do that. So we ponder, who are we becoming? What is the purpose of church? And secondly, we prepare. We are people that need to prepare for what God is leading us into. What we know is that the world has changed and that church isn't easier than it ever was. It's harder than it's ever been in America. Two weeks ago, the Pew Research team released a study. Many of you have read it because you've talked to me about it. That talks about that we have seen a 7% decline in Christian worship in the last seven years in America. And in the Pro Protestant tradition, mainline churches like our own, we've seen 5 million people walk out of church and never come back. And so what the research has said is that we are losing people faster than we're gaining them. Why? Because it doesn't work what we used to do. The favorite phrase of churches is that we've never done it that way. Well, you know what? We can't keep doing it that way because it doesn't work. The proof is in the number of butts and pews in your giving. The butts and pews have declined and your giving has declined. You can't survive another 10 years the way that we've been going. We've never done it that way needs to be the curse word of our church. And we take it and we ball it and throw it out as far as east is from west and say, Spirit of God, do something fresh and new among us. Because there's countless individuals in this community that need good news. Is it hard to change? Amen. Amen. If we don't change, we're all sitting on the Titanic, waiting for the iceberg. I personally don't want to be the captain of a Titanic. 
I want to be a people that are vibrant and full of energy and life and, and expectation. And so let's do this together. We do it together. And lastly, we persevere. We persevere. As soon as I got here, I said to almost everyone on staff, we're going to work together for a purpose. And the council is going to point the direction for us and we're going to be on a team together to work for that purpose. But it's not a lukewarm kind of thing. You're either in and ready to work hard together or you're out. And I don't take it personally, but we need people that are willing, not just on staff, but the laity, that are willing to say, we're going to persevere through the bumps that are going to be in the road. Because we can't do everything perfectly. I don't know about you, I look at my life, it's not perfect. Amen? But what we're going to do is we're going to learn together and grow together and make purposeful changes so that we can become vibrant, alive, and see this place full of generations and generations of people. So we're going to persevere through the negative stuff. We're going to persevere through the change. We're going to persevere through what has been a season of loss back into a season of growth that we're already seeing. And in 10 years, we're going to look around at each other and high five and say, God is good. God is really good. Can you believe what we're doing at Central Union Church and the way that we get to transform our community? And we're going to do it because we have great laity. We have a priesthood of all believers in which there's no such thing as a pew-sitter. Only active participants in this kingdom of God. We have great music and music staff. We have great pastoral leadership. We have great accounting staff. We have great buildings and ground staff. We have great lay leaders that are on council and leaders that are teachers and leaders that work in the thrift store two days a week and leaders that come here and bless the little kids in the preschool and leaders that do things that we will never know about but do it because they love you. But there's enough space for all of us to be a part of it. And so next week, I believe, is this hinge point. May 31st, easy to remember. That we as a community gather around this idea that God is doing something fresh and new and we're launching a mission that says we engage and embrace all as we seek to embody Christ. And if we live by the mission, watch out. That image of Acts 2, Pentecost Day, the Spirit fills the space and the people in it and they rise up and say, let's go. Let's go be God's people for this day and age. May it be so among you. May we rise up and say, we are your people, O oh God. Use us to transform your world. May it be so. Amen.